Thanks everyone for being here for our sixth advisory committee meeting. Uh, I'm excited that we have both Ted and Hugh in town um, to give us some updates and as we move on to the second phase of our master plan and talk about finalizing the Cleveland Public Market Corporation board nominees. I think this is our sixth out of four meetings. Right? Yeah, I think I promised like, to like, <laughs> like, be like six meetings. <laughs> thank you all for uh, sticking with it. <laughs> Let me see if it's a work page down. Wake up. There we go. There we go. Um, yes, yeah, so we have a bunch to cover tonight. Um, Jessica will do some updates. Um, uh, so part of this is about the transition plan and sharing uh, the board nominees to, uh, to review all of that. Um, and I think everyone has been sent a copy of the bylaws. So we're not going to go over that tonight, but you have sent, you've seen it. If you, I any comments? I have sent the bylaws. Uh, you did. You did. Didn't you? I no? Did you send the bylaws? No. Oh, never mind. But bylaws are almost ready to be sent. Um, you were sent the phase one report. So again. The articles, not the bylaws. Oh, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. All right. Um, uh, so we're. We're, you know, I didn't plan, don't plan to discuss the report, just if there's any questions or comments about that. But we're going to get into phase two, which is um, uh, kind of some of, the phil some of the philosophy, the develop and design principles, and share the strategies, the core strategies of uh, what we, we want to accomplish. Um, and so I'll talk about that. And then we'll get into some design recommendations uh, for um, the basement and the mezzanine. So Hugh is here to review his recommendations for how to reconfigure the design. There's some, I think, some really exciting programmatic elements about that and talk a little bit about these two parking lots, um, uh, uh, the opportunities, and again, put our, our input on some of that process. Unless anyone has anything, I will jump right into it. Any thing, issues, burning questions? All right. So Jessica, grants and updates. Okay, a uh, couple updates. Um, since our last meeting, we received a grant from the Mount Sinai Health Foundation to fund uh, this master planning process, which is excellent. That means that it's about halfway funded. Um, we have a grant pending with the George Gunn Foundation. Their board meets next week, and I'm hopeful that we'll get good news on that grant. So those are the two kind of pending proposals that we've had. How much was the Mount Sinai grant? A hundred thousand okay. dollars. And then the Gunn Foundation, I requested a hundred and fifty thousand, and we requested a hundred and fifty thousand. Uh, so those are the two big grant requests that we had pending, and now I'm looking at the grant cycle, sort of this next upcoming grant cycle. Um, so that's that on grants. Any questions? Okay. Uh, next is the community conversation theory series. I think we've renamed it Food for Thought, even though it's a little corny, but <laughs> I think it's nice. Um, so this is that series of seven conversations that'll be taking place all around Cleveland uh, that I've talked a little bit about. Uh, we've been doing a little bit more work on finding locations. So I think we'll do one at the Cleveland History Center. We'll do one of these talks at the Greater Cleveland Food Bank. Uh, we'll do them at Great Lakes and at Market Garden Brewery, just sort of trying to move around the city and not just have them near West Side. Uh, that series will kick off on March 15th at the City Club with the City Club Luncheon. Uh, it'll be moderated by Mayor Bibb and we'll have uh, speakers from Detroit's public market, Baltimore's public market, and Cincinnati's public market to really just talk about kind of the value of public markets to their communities generally, talk about their transitions, you know, all of the, the exciting things that they do in their communities. Um, I just reached out to ask about kind of reserving a table to see if we can get advisory committee members to join if you guys are available. It would be great to have a nice showing of members at that city club talk. Any questions there? Uh, I'm really excited about the whole series. I think it'll lay a nice foundation for really why public markets are important and get people talking not just about the transition, but all of the things that Westside Market can be in the future. Um, the next is the executive director search. So pending um, kind of how everything goes tonight, we are hoping to announce a couple things tomorrow afternoon. The initial Cleveland Public Market Corporation Board uh, and those members, uh, the launch of the executive director search. So we have a final job profile based on the input that you all gave. Uh, so that'll be launched and then also just publish the phase one report. So that'll all be sort of captured in one release. Uh, so that's 
a lot of big news all at once. Um, the downside of doing it all, all at once is I'm a little nervous that parts of this will get lost. Um, so I will likely send all of you a nudge asking to share this executive director job profile within your networks. Uh, we really want to get some great candidates for the position. Um, and then all of you have that reports or that profile. So if there's anything you see that you want tweaked before it goes live, I mean, we can always make other tweaks, but, uh, and that's, I think all of my updates. Big week. Great. Thank you. All right. Well, still you. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to like, Ramat was texting me. I'm afraid she can't hear us. Um, Okay, so um, everyone, sorry, let me try to do both things. Um, this is our proposed inaugural board of the Cleveland Public Market Corporation. Uh, we got to these names a couple ways. Um, I called each of you asking if you would be interested in serving on the board, uh, and if not, if you, or even if you were, if you had recommendations of other people who would be interested in serving on the board. Um, I took all of that feedback, um, a lot of people who are engaged on this committee said that they would love to, but they don't have time or, you know, they have other obligations. Um, kind of looked at that board matrix that we put together. And then I worked with the internal team in the mayor's office uh, and then also the Tenants Association to identify additional candidates who would fill some of the requirements of that board matrix that we set forward. Um, so these initial 15 represent the first uh, the inaugural board for Cleveland Public Market Corporation with sort of your input and uh, recommendation. It's really important to me and the mayor that this board is endorsed by this advisory committee. Um, so we wanna make sure everyone feels good about it going forward. Um, the three members who are being put forth by the Tenants Association are Amanda Dempsey, Henry Hilo, and Tom Nagel. Uh, the three members who are be being put forth by the mayor are Dave Abbott, Jason Russell, and Ramat Wiley. And then Carrie McCormick is the council representative. Um, that's only relevant in the future for really like, who gets appointed by whom and when the term comes up. Um, each person, will, we haven't done this process yet, but I think what we had talked about in previous meetings was to just sort of randomly assign who gets a one-year, two-year, and a three-year term for their initial term. And then after that, uh, there's an, a limit on how many three-year consecutive terms you can have. So only three consecutive three-year terms. Do you want to go through the matrix? Sure. So um, as you recall, we had three different sections of the board matrix. Uh, the first was kind of lived experience where we're looking for various diversity measures. And so I think you asked people to fill it out. Was that the, mm -hmm. your process? Um, so these were the categories. If you, had, you remember, we had that very long. I broke it up into pieces just for to fit on the screen. Uh, but in terms of geography, um, looking at who can live within a you know, walkable neighborhood adjacent to the market, who from the east side, who from the west side, uh, who from the county, and, and uh, who from the region. Um, you can see the race and ethnicity uh, breakdown, um, gender, uh, age, and, and then we had the, the who, people have some connection with food assistance and with small business ownership. So that's, that's what this group, I think, you know, and it's, it's important that as we put, as Jessica put together this, she was very much looking at the boxes, but also recall we have, this is 15, and there is room for 21 on the board. And so it's, um, you know, one thing that the board can think about is that when it adds future uh, members is, are there some holes uh, that, that we're missing uh, in, in all the three years? So this is the lived experience, a one expertise. Um, Jessica divided up into super strengths, strengths, and weaknesses. And by this, there are you know, uh, more than 10 of these folks had expertise in governance and nonprofits, marketing and media relations, and strategic planning. Uh, four to nine board members had expertise in uh, facility management, financial management, fundraising, HR program expertise, and small business and entrepreneurship. And then some area where there's a little bit of weakness, but still people, I think, right, who did represent all these categories in uh, food and ag historic preservation, information technology, law, and uh, real estate. Again, the one person that we didn't include in the matrix because he came in later was Henry Hilo, um, who is a lawyer. So he would add to the, the law would be increased. And you don't want too many lawyers anyway on, uh, on the board. 
And then the last area was around uh, uh, connections. So again, we have these three categories. Uh, 10 plus board members uh, had connections with cultural organizations and foundations. Four and nine with uh, corporations, the BIPOC communities, government merchants, media outlets, and uh, young adults. And then a little bit weaker on communities of faith, uh, LGBTQI uh, communities, uh, older folks, pay, uh, youth, and rural suburban communities. So yeah, my sense is that it's done a pretty good job actually uh, having all the, everything we said we wanted, we have representation uh, on the board. So like most things, Jessica does a great job. And um, you know, off, off to a, a good start with this. Uh, I'm just calling her mom so she can oh, hear us. Okay. All right, so that's, this is the information on the board. We wanna leave time to, if there are any comments or thoughts about membership, or again, again I think, you know, I guess we, we've, our, our, the strategy here is that the mayor appoints the initial board based on the uh, advisory committee's recommendation, based on the input we decided and all the other, other pieces. So we want whatever to be comfortable with this, particularly if, it, if it's, if, uh, you know, uh, will go public. So now is, the, now is the time to talk about it if there is an issue. I guess one question I have, there's the opportunity to go up to 21 timeline for that, because we obviously have identified weaknesses, right, that we need uh, greater representation, but I guess that would change too over time of like as we're operating to figure out what we really need. I, I think leaving some headroom is a good idea. Like get started, you know, you don't, also 15 is a lot of people, 21 right. is a lot of people, right? So there's a lot of work to be done. Go through the first year, you know, there, there needs to be a nomination process even for the, you know, hopefully fairly pro forma for the three, for the five people who are one year, but at the annual meeting, uh, you know, at that point, the governing committee would say, hey, we want to add, you know, uh, some folks. So I, I give it a little time. But it's at the discretion, yeah, of, the discretion of, of, of the board. I'm, yeah, so it's a matter of making this, like, get going, get started, figure it out, see where there's some holes, and, and some people who maybe come forward. Um, you know, the, the transition itself won't happen until the fall anyway, so the board gets started now. There's, there's work to be done, but you know, until you really get into the operations and I think really see it, you might want to hold some space to add people later. Do you guys want to talk at all about the like process that you guys went through for the Tenants Association? Mm -hmm. Or I can speak to it. I mean, you kind of went through like a nominating process through the yeah. yeah. We had about 10 candidates. We kind of went through and had our meetings and looked for strengths and weaknesses. And, our, and, and one thing I think I want to note too is we had talked about whether or not vendors themselves should serve on the board. Um, initially, we had talked about having a prohibition that said vendors could not serve on the board um, directly. So if you were an owner, you could not be on the board. We've taken that language out of the bylaws, but the vendors have decided that they want to choose representatives for themselves. So um, you guys could have nominated vendors, but decided to choose these representatives. So we could be involved in the committees and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. That's the important thing. As well. Yeah, and not conflict yourself out of yeah. important board decision making. Any, do we want to put thumbs up, thumbs down or anything or affirmatively say something? Or? There's no official approval required, is there? There's not, although I think I would, I would love to be able to tell the mayor tomorrow, like the, what the advisory committee voted to endorse this slate of candidates. So if you're willing. I would move approval. <laughs> Second. Any more conversation? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? There you have it. It's Thank on camera. Know. All right. <laughs> it's not live streams. So I'm going to ahead of myself. <laughs> you may not leave the room. All right. Great. Well, thank you. Okay, great. This is a big step, really big step. So thank you all for, for that. Um, super. Okay. Master plan. I saw you printed it, Tom, because you love to have reports on your, on, on your shelves. I'm going to add it to to the stack, yeah. <laughs> I haven't seen it printed actually. It looks pretty nice. Yeah. <laughs> you printed it a little more responsibly. <laughs> yeah. Dull side of black and white. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, great. So, um, you know, again, I wasn't going to go through anything that's in there. There is some new information that we have not gone through, particularly some, um, uh, some uh, analysis of a capture rate and, and kind of an assessment of um, 
uh, square footages of demand for different products and again, kind of technical stuff. But it does justify, uh, undergird, uh, I should say, uh, some of the recommendations that we've, we've been talking about in terms of um, uh, demand for prepared foods. So there is more quantification of that. So um, not, this is not everyone's cup of tea. Jessica said she really enjoyed it. It's her cup of right, tea. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, so I, we don't want to spend time t today on it. But if, unless everyone has a question or a comment, um, uh, hopefully it is uh, readable. And <laughs> or if you need something to put you to sleep at night, it might make a good soporific. Uh, anyway, um, that's done. So uh, unless there's, there's further comment or concern, uh, then obviously we're moving on to the next phases of work uh, with the project. And again, the intention is to make this public right as of so it'll be on a website tomorrow. tomorrow. Well, yeah. it might be on the website today. Oh, yeah, it's out there already. Um, so any thoughts or questions or anything on that piece? Great. All right. We are off of phase one, phase two. Um, so uh, this is the language in the scope of services uh, in, in, in our, our contract with OCI. Um, phase two is the vision and program development. So one task is to um, create a set of development and design principles. And these are meant to, to you know, be based on the results of the market research and our experience and the mission, and identify the core strategies for increasing the customer base, diversifying the merchants and program mix, and addressing interior and exterior spaces to improve the customer experience. So that's our, our task in this phase of work. And um, so these are eight principles um, uh, which I'd like to go through, because again, these are meant to be the, the core strategy of what we do in this master plan. So number one, prioritize the market's traditional product offerings, fresh food, particularly meat, seafood, poultry, seafood, and produce, uh, and specialty products. Uh, two, support the long-term multi-generational businesses in the market. Uh, three, expand the product offerings to include more ethnic specialties and prepared food and beverages. Four, diversify the merchant population to better represent the region's racial and ethnic composition. Five, expand food production within the market. Six, introduce technologies that better serve customers. Seven, increase the availability and promotion of local foods, including participation of regional farmers. And eight, become the, pre the preeminent place to learn about and celebrate food. Um, any response, anything I'm missing you think it's kind of core to what we're trying to accomplish? So as I was reading those, to me, if I had to prioritize, number one and number two are the number one priorities that we need to reinforce. Because mm -hmm. I think we need to educate, not educate, but reinforce to the region like the, what the core principle is of the West Side Market, because I think that's been lost and forgotten before we start adding to the new, right? Because okay. I hate for people to think of the West Side Market as a place to get prepared food when like the core of it is the grocery side of it yeah. and supporting the small businesses. Mm -hmm. So, I think as you're going through these, it's like prioritizing, like what's the first thing that you really want the community to understand mm -hmm. and really know it? This is what the West Side Market stands for. But they are number one and two, so I agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I know. Good for conversation. Yeah, great, okay. Uh, uh, anything that not, I mean, do you think they need like a different weight than everything else? I mean, besides being number one and two, do they need to be, I mean, again, I mean, th these could apply equal weight and, and, and they are different. Um, I mean, I did rank them. Kind of. Um. I don't know. I just kind of look at it as a menu of options. If someone just walked up the street, they might say, I'll take a number four and a number <laughs> five, right? Yeah. But like we, <laughs> one and two is like number one. one. You yeah. get one, one and two no matter what. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yep, I hear you. But the other things will definitely allow one and two to be successful. Absolutely. You know, that, that they kind of all go together in, in, in a way. I, I understand, yeah. Yeah. I agree with you. Yeah. But I think the others will assure mm -hmm. one well, and it two. does say, also, like prioritize and support, so it does mm -hmm. like call attention to those as being more important. important. Anyone on the phone? Any thoughts, comments? For Mount Set of Sons, promising for growth. She said, kind of beyond one and two. Great. Okay, I don't know if there's any. Great. Dan's on. Tanisha's on the phone, too. Dan's on the phone. All right. Yeah, Anthony. We can always come back to this, of course, too. 
All right, so the next one is, is kind of related our um, design principles. Um, so again, the, the core strategy is to design and to, to drive any physical changes to the market. So one is around preserving the historic structure and uses while updating equipment and systems to, for code compliance, greater functionality, comfort, resiliency, efficiency, and reduced environmental impact. Two, to upgrade storage, food preparation, loading, and waste management to improve efficiency and reduce negative impacts, such as smells and rodents. Three, provide optimal displays for each merchant's merchandising needs, maintaining a balance between consistent design principle, design elements, and individual characteristics. Four, to accommodate product circulation via pallets. Five, to provide various eating areas. Six, to create dynamic spaces for educational and event programming. Seven, to expand and enhance on-site management offices. And eight, to minimize disruption to operations. I think one, one thing we added recently was this pallet piece. And I want you to make, just make a few comments about the pallets. And you, of course, the produce folks know all about that. But it's somewhat unique in the market world. Right. Yeah, as as all, all of you may know, I, I, I've been doing markets for 35 years. I mean, that, this, that's all I do in my business is work with public markets around the country. And I think one thing that's really unique about Westside is, is you are a pallet-driven market. And I really don't know of any other markets in the U.S. that, that are that way. Retail markets. Both Retail things. markets. Yeah. You know, and so I think I think that's what makes you unique. I think that's why you know you have so many butchers and, and produce people and and so forth. And I think it, it, it's it's a key to your, how you operate. And we have to do everything we can to to protect that and, and make hopefully make it a little bit more efficient. So. It's not something I knew was unique to our market. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Most markets don't have four freight elevators. <laughs> but also allows you can having the smaller merchant spaces upstairs because the downstairs is so important. Mm -hmm. And so what happens in the basement is it's not common in other markets in the same scale, or not in recent ones anyway. Right, any? If this is going to go public, do you not want to call out the roads? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, there's roads there? Yeah. Yeah. Correct. There's uh, one that's in every grocery store. <laughs> 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 I guess. I guess. I guess. I guess. I guess. I guess. Yeah. Strike that too. Yeah. Happy to do it. Okay. We're working on that, right? Yeah, well, always, always, always. <laughs> everyone, yeah. Everyone. Okay. Any other comments or thoughts? Yeah, we're about to show how all this gets implemented in physical design. So, but again, I, I do, I'd like to start with the principle um, because we're hopefully we can uh, show you how we're doing this in two different spaces in the market uh, next. I think one thing that stands out to me is we're providing eating areas is on this list because when you talk to a customer, I think often customers talk most about eating areas. This is a very like vendor focused list to me. Like, I, I just wanna note that, that it's really emphasizing what's going to make this a more efficient place to do business before, you know, everything else. But we're gonna do it all, so. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. We're gonna eat the great food, yeah. Tanisha was saying, like, customers, the number one concern from customers is where to eat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we'll do it with having a pigeon stare down. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's talk about the basement. All right. As most of you know, uh, who've been to West Side or have been down in the basement, this is your basement. It's basically 15 large rooms with a whole bunch of wire cages in it. Two are dry, 13 are refrigerated. And realistically, the way I look at it, it's basically five streets. There's the main street, and then you have a series of parallel alleys here and, and parallel alleys up there. And so one of the things we wanted to do was, it's really, that's very inefficient. So one of the things we wanted to do with the new design was try to, to reduce the amount of circulation and, and, and increase the amount of square footage and, and give us opportunities for other things downstairs. As well as addressing all the shortcomings. That's right. So, yeah. okay. So again, pictures are downstairs, and right now we have electrical panels in the main circulation. Uh, the, uh, the upper right-hand picture just shows typical cages, the lower left uh, right-hand picture as well. Um, and again, one of the things we're trying to do is, 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 is except for dry storage, which would be like paper goods, you know, uh, jar goods and so forth, that, that works fine in cages, but ideally we'd like to start going to individual coolers 
where uh, it's just easier to mainly to prevent cross contamination of foods. I, I've been involved. I haven't been involved. But I know of a couple of other markets that they did not hire me, uh, but they have they have these large coolers with with uh, chain link fences in them, and because of some outbreak of, of uh, f food uh, poisoning or whatever, the whole market was shut down because they couldn't figure out where the where the contamination was coming from. So going forward, we'd like to go to a more individual walk-in structure, and that way it can be isolated if there is an issue, and the whole market doesn't have to shut down. So. So some of the things we're adding here is um, we are talking about adding a, a couple small commercial kitchens downstairs because I think uh, for a number of the vendors it would be provide a great opportunity for like you know an example would be like the seafood vendor right now he can't he can't sell any prepared seafood to complement his um, his uh, uh, fresh product and so again it's it's just another uh, revenue stream for some of the vendors uh, you know even from like the butcher point of view you could start doing I, I'm not sure whether you do like marinated different kebabs and meats and so forth, but hopefully you, have, you could have a facility now that, that would give you ability if you, if you choose to go that way. So again, we're just trying to figure out ways to help increase revenue stream for, particularly for the existing fresh food vendors who are there. Uh, the one of the things that we're talking about too is adding a new elevator. Right, right now the freight elevators are, are extremely small, but there's really not much we can do about it because of the limitations of the shafts. So particularly uh, for the produce, we're hoping to add a new large freight elevator that actually would be connected from the arcade down to the basement and over. Because actually, the footprint of the existing basement actually goes underneath the arcade for a small portion. And so ideally, we can put a, a freight elevator there and a staircase. So in many ways, you don't have to go all the way across the loading dock to get to the arcade space. So that's so. the arcade on the west side of the building? Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, right. Yeah. Those photographs you're talking about. Those. Right. Uh, Good. And then I have this pallet jacking station. That's Tom's memorial pallet jack charging station. But one of the things, too, again, we're trying to keep the pallet jacks out of, out of, out of the walk-in coolers and so forth because they take a valuable space. They need to be charged and so forth. So the idea is to create a space where, where the pallet jacks could be lined up and be charging overnight or whatever and out of the way. So right now, I don't think the market has any storage space whatsoever. So we're trying to create a little bit of storage space, especially if we could try to create a much more of a diverse activity event program for the market. Um, so we're trying to create some market space. Um, right now, we would also create some space downstairs in the basement because hopefully as the nonprofit takes over, there's going to be more staffing needs. And there's only so many people we can fit on the second floor. So the idea is we would create some office space downstairs as well for, and also a locker room downstairs. Uh, the public bathrooms, the, one of the biggest surveys ever done in supermarkets is, What's the most important thing a, a supermarket can provide? And most people think produce, food, whatever. It's how clean their how clean their restrooms are. And so I think realistically, just from a, an experience point of view, I think the restrooms restrooms need to be upgraded, expanded. Right now, they're they're quite amazing. Um, so that that would be in, in part of the plan too. And then again, what's uh, the city's just built a new kind of cleaning facility for for the pallet jacks and for large pieces of equipment and trays, and that just makes a lot of sense. You, you need a big space where you can steam clean some some of your equipment and so forth. So, okay, you go to the plan. Make sure that the photographs are okay. And the two photographs are we did a, a two. Uh, th these are actually two kitchens back to back in uh, the downtown market in Grand Rapids. So they're two commercial kitchens we put into that public market. Uh, they proved in incredibly valuable to the market. A lot of startups start here, and then start selling their product downstairs, and then eventually actually take over a stall downstairs. So uh, it's, it's just a great resource. So I, this picture, thanks to Tom, his pallet jack charging station. Uh, but it'd be similar to that in the basement. Um, again, a lot of health departments don't let, let uh, chain link anymore in uh, food areas because it can't be as well clean as, as powder coated. So we'd be suggesting a new kind of uh, cage system for, for all the dry storage and uh, just some new door systems, you know, so we can kind of zone off the basement and, and better control the environment down there. So these are kind of automatic doors that go up and down. So this is kind of like the concept where we are at this stage of the process. Uh, it doesn't mean it won't change, but but basically, uh, what the different colors 
indicate is, is the red is basically refrigerated walk-ins or uh, meat uh, preparation areas for butchers and so forth. Uh, the dark green are the produce refrigeration produce stands and so forth. The blue would be refrigerated in a prep area for the seafood. Uh, the pale green would be the dry cages and so forth. Um, the orange is the locker room, break room. Uh, but basically, as you can see, there's the really three streets. There's one, there's the main street, and then there's, there's, a, there's a one street. So just by doing that alone, the amount of, of, of space left over for, 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 for walk-ins and for dry storage just increases a lot. And so in many ways, that allows us to take that uh, space that we've gained and create the two kitchens without losing too much of the uh, maximum amount of storage space you already have downstairs. So that's what's really great about that. Right. Yeah. The elevator, so. Right. And then over here, this is actually the end of the market building. Uh, the arcade's actually here. And so that's where we're bringing the freight and staircase up into the existing arcade building. So it works out really well. So in many ways, uh, the, whoever has a stall in the, in the West Arcade can either use the stairs or the freight elevator, come down to this main corridor, which right now is, is, a, is one of the storage spit rooms and then come down and get to their uh, coolers or, or whatever. Space down here is, is, is the electric char charging space uh, next to the larger cleaning room that's just been built downstairs. One thing we're talking about is totally revamping. Right now, the, the restrooms, the existing public restrooms, are kind of limited by the, where the space is. So in many ways, what we're trying to do is actually push it out into where some of the, where some of the refrigeration is today. And that would let us just create a much nicer space and experience. The other thing we're, we're suggesting is actually bringing an elevator that would connect the second floor office space with the ground floor and then also go down to the restroom. So like if you're a mother with a baby carriage or a dad with a baby carriage, you don't have to take them all the way down the stairs and get to the restroom. I mean, realistically, from an ADA point of view, we need to have that uh, elevator access. And for the, and for the offices, too. Maybe. And also for the offices, too. So. So it'd be one, one new elevator that would serve both the offices and the, the, the new restroom location. And then basically, well, you have, you have an enlargement on the kitchen, right? Okay. 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 So one of the improvements we're suggesting now is, is again, doing a conditioned walk-in space where the butchers and so forth could do their uh, butchering and so forth. Uh, and so it, it pretty much lays out like, similar to what, what, what you're using in your cages today except it would, it would be all cooler walls. And the other big thing is we're putting three compartment sinks and hand sinks in those spaces. So it's not like you have to go to, you know, down the corridor, you know, 100 feet or so to, to clean your wares and so forth. It just, uh, you know, it just really meets the, the new codes and so forth. And would those be individual to a vendor or are those shared? It'd be individual. individual. So th this would be one, one, one butcher space, this would be another butcher space, and so on and so on. And then depending on the size of the particular butcher, uh, if he's a larger player, he, he would have attached walk-in box to his space. So basically he'd be doing his prep work here and then storing his meat cuts and so forth in this space. If you want the smaller people, smaller butchers, it, it might all be within one, you know, walk-in, large walk-in. How much does this line up with what the current usage and need is and then allow for future growth or is it you know. we, one of the, one of the, con, one of the things, concepts we did is, is, is I did all the math of all the vendors and what they're using today and their walk-ins and so forth. And, and, kind of, and the other thing we're trying to do too is, is break them into modulars. So like if, if, if say Tom's business right now has like a bunch of cages sketch and it adds up to 500 square feet, again, I don't want to give them a 5,000 square foot cooler. I want to break it up into maybe three to four coolers to add up to that 5,000, I mean, yeah, 500 square feet, with the idea that it, maybe his business will downsize and he'll only need two, two of them at some, at some point. Right, right. And that gives us the, the ability to rent the other ones. Sure. And the other thing we're trying to do with this, even from an operational point of view, right now, the, all the square footage downstairs in the basement is running, conditioning all the time. And generally, food doesn't, some food doesn't need as much cooling and so ideally you want your each walk-in to be a, to tell the master machine and all the electric charges and all that stuff when, when do I need to really be cool or when can I just sh shut off basically and so that's the other advantage and the other advantage too is if you're not using those particular coolers you shut those coils off 
and, and then you're not conditioning, you know, 2,000 square feet of space that, that you're not even using. You know, right now this is like a 40% you know vacancy of all the refrigerated coolers downstairs, and that's just you know you're just paying for all that energy all the time. And also even even with the subtleties, like particularly with produce and so forth. He doesn't, they don't need all the same temperature for all the particular vegetables and fruits and so forth. So this way we can adjust the temperatures based on their actual needs and so forth. So, which is positive. So. Okay. And this is uh, uh, basically a kitchen. It pretty much looks just like those couple of photographs you, you saw. I mean, I basically just took the Grand Rapids, you know, footprint. And, and dropped into here, mainly because we've had such, a, such great success with it. It seems to serve a lot of different vendor types, whether you're a baker, doing cupcake, doing candy, or, or doing salsa and so forth. But one kitchen is more, I call it bakery orientated, and then another kitchen is more for more geared toward prepared food. But because the, the equipment's so versatile, it, it can serve a lot of different purposes. And so that, the concept is you could actually have two, uh, two people using the kitchens at the same time because they're basically divided and separated by doors. Uh, and then there'd be a kind of a general cleaning area for all the you know, dishwashing the pots and pans and so forth. And then they would rent whatever dry storage or, or walk-ins outside the kitchen you know, for the product that between when they're preparing or ingredients coming in or whatever. So, and then we also have a little office downstairs because ideally there will be someone kind of mastering and controlling all the craziness that usually takes place with these kitchens, so like just scheduling and, and everything else, and just making sure that it's being cleaned up at, like properly after, after its use. So we just met with, um, the, the, who were they? <laughs> we met with staff from Cleveland Clinic. We met with um, the folks from Cleveland Central Kitchen, oh, and then also STIR um, Cooking School to review both of these to kind of get a better understanding of what's already in the market, what's like the marketplace, um, what's working, what's not working, what are the needs, what are the demands for spaces like this. And it was a really productive conversation and kind of came out of it with everyone saying, like, yes, this is important for the market to have from their perspectives. Yeah, and I think, you know, for at least what we learned from all our interviews with the merchants is that many would utilize it right away. Some might consider using it. And I think they'd be the first preference, to obviously, to support existing merchants in the market to support their businesses. And then if, the, if we find that there is more time than is being utilized, then there'll be opportunities to work with other entrepreneurs to use the space, potentially as part of a program, as a day stall program, to sell in the market, make stuff here, sell it in the market, or you know, even other outside uh, groups. So again, the, the folks from the, the central kitchen said they can't build enough space to meet the demand. So they, you know, you know, part of our meeting with them was to make sure we weren't stepping on toes or you know, stealing their clients or anything like that. And I think it was the opposite. They're like, there's such demand, it makes so much sense to have this in the market. Yeah, I think most of it will be used by market merchants, but if it's not, then it can be rented you know, on an hourly basis or something you know, to outside entrepreneurs too, supporting our entrepreneurship uh, objectives for the nonprofit. From a space and design perspective, is it <clears throat> set up for teaching? No. No. At all. You know, yeah, that's, that's upstairs. Right. I mean, you could, you, you could do, if, if, if you're trying to teach more like a commercial use, well, it, it, you could use it for this because, I mean, that's how a lot of schools do it. It's just a real kitchen and everybody comes in and does it. But we have, we have another uh, kitchen to show you. Well, but, uh, I mean, I think during kind of teaching, right? So if there's a startup entrepreneur who needs support, mm -hmm. you know, hopefully the, the, the kitchen manager is hired, has a culinary background, production background, and so they're there to support. And maybe there's additional services you pay for or subsidize somehow, right, uh, through some grant to, to help them. So they're that kind of teaching, but this is a production kitchen, not a, a, a kind of a, a general public education. And my understanding from Finley Market in Cincinnati is that they're commercial kitchens are really key to diversifying the vendors that they have in the market because they can start with people kind of in these spaces and then work with them, integrate them into the market, you know, get everybody ready to go and then move into a bigger space. So it's a good opportunity to scale people into spaces. Because the other reality too is, is you know, with, with us trying to bring new vendors into the space because you do have the vacancies right now, th that, that person has to prepare the food someplace. And so then it gets into the whole commissary thing and then bring the food here. And just, again, it just starts to blow the economics out of the water to make it successful. So the fact that we have these kitchens here, you know, I, I, it just, again, just gives us more chance to really create business incubators. 
and our limitation to put cooking hood. We, we can't put cooking hoods even if, if we wanted to upstairs. So right. the fact that you figure out a way to get a hood down here and snake it up into a shaft mm -hmm. um, gives some opportunity for some more you know, a, a diverse, a diverse product that can be created here and then served upstairs because of the short distance. Because I, I will say that's the only, I, that, that's, that's the biggest flaw right now in your market as it is today is the fact that you know so many markets around the country do have the ability to to bake bread and bake cookies and all this stuff right in front of people and so you know that would be a nice you know thing to at least add a few things to it. I mean you get some great bakeries here but it's just another opportunity so. Warm cookies? More cookies. <laughs> Warm cookies. <laughs> so. All right. So do you have the numbers on, you know, today we have this amount of dry storage. Your new plan provides 120% based on what we have currently. How does that play out? Basically, um, right now you have approximately like 11,700 total refrigerated and dry, dry space. Mm -hmm. You know, with this layout here and all, all the variations, I'm, I'm probably around 10 something. You say, oh, well, God, we're going down. But remember, 40% that's vacant. So right now, you have 7,500 square feet of, of space being used. Um, so I went back and kind of balanced that. With, because I also think that, you know, right now, both arcade buildings are kind of underutilized. And so, so that we're going, it, once we gear up again and seem to get them strong again, we're going to need more refrigeration to, to balance that aspect. So. And they all have to balance that also with efficiency, right, and, and, right. Uh, and quality, you know. So there's a lot, so many factors, right? But you know, I, I think I think everyone probably agrees that you need to kind of wipe the basement clean and start over. It's just it's just beyond its useful life, and and uh, and so it's bring, bring everything to code, bring everything you know quality. So it, this won't be cheap, obviously, to implement, yeah. um, but it's pretty essential to you know, meet all the goals we, we talked about, particularly yeah. for uh, efficiency. Stop using you know potable water to cool eight hundred thousand dollars of the water and. So many things, right? That that we are trying to uh, meet the objectives of, mm -hmm. and really it's critical 400, that it's coming out of city management too. What was that? Because it's coming out of city management, yeah. like really critical from like a code compliance yes, yes. perspective. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I think well, honestly, the health department's giving you a, a free ride for a long time, and and you know, ideally, we don't want at some point for the you know for that lightning bolt to come down. So. Well, and that access to the produce arcade seems like would solve so many oh, internal gosh, yeah. issues and conflicts that really seems. If I could do one thing tomorrow, I think I'd have that <laughs> yes. elevator. Yeah, yeah. 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 That elevator. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 Just having them going in and out yeah. in the weather and all that stuff, yeah. you just you feel so bad for them every single time. Right. It's mm -hmm. like, you know, underground? Who knew? <laughs> That's great. <laughs> And, and, and the other discussion too, before we come kind of come up with a final plan too, is you know if we decide to to condition the the arcade, um, then realistically the the produce vendors don't have to break down almost everything you know on a particularly hot day or a particularly cold day, and bring it all down. Ideally, a bunch of the produce would stay upstairs, so then they don't need as much refrigeration downstairs. So, I mean that that will play into our final you know recommendations as well. We just haven't got there yet. Right. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. But but it, it's it's bottom line. It's just hurting, hurting the bottom line. The more you yeah. you do that, you right. know. So. I mean, especially when people come in and you've got you know you're in a you're in a, a somewhat controlled environment when you're in there. Or not really. Doors are opening. This that and the other thing. You don't have heat. You don't have air. And then even if the things that they're that they uh, you know their cases, if you want to call them, or how they set up their stand. It would be huge to be able to, I mean, a grocery store doesn't take everything out and go put it away. I mean, but they have to because they, they have to make sure that their product is sellable and good. So you, you can't just be like, eh, I'll get it tomorrow. You know, it's not like that. So anything that, especially to bring in people and the people who have, I think it's very important not to forget the people who have been there, whether they're inside the arcade or in the market house itself, the people that have been there this whole time dealing with all this stuff mm -hmm. that they deser deserve, you know, the people that put the time in to really benefit from the stuff that's happening here. And any way that we could do that, of course, it's going to promote, you know, more people wanting to rent there and be a vendor mm -hmm. and, and promote with the customer service as well, because whatever you're doing, the product is going to reflect that. If he doesn't have, if Tommy doesn't have to go outside 
and it's 20 below, and he's, you know, uh, you know, he's going to be a happier guy, mm -hmm. which means he's going, not that you're not right now, but you are, <laughs> very much so, but um, you'll, you'll, you literally change how people feel, not only working there, but coming there. I mean, when you have a better work environment, That's hands right. down, yeah, it, it, changes, it changes everything. I mean, I, I, most of you are, are in the business who are working in the market. It's, it's, it's for a passion. Ideally, you want to do anything you can to, to, to make the lifestyle a little bit nicer. So, so then your passion, you just work, go on the important things. So. I also want to mention that, that Hugh did uh, speak with a variety of other merchants in advance of this mm -hmm. plan. So we got input from mm -hmm. Tom and, and others, right, so, and uh, Don. So. Um, hopefully, it's going to meet their needs. And, and again, this is a conceptual plan. It, you know, once we really get more into the the, the, the grass, it'll, 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 it'll modify, change more. But I, I feel I think the strategy is correct. I think it's the approach is right. It's just really how we kind of shape every every space based on vendor needs. So, so generally speaking, there's a reduction in the the storage space. Mm -hmm. And I guess if we go with the assumption that we're going to be fully leased out. Um, all the vendor spots. Um, what's the gut reaction from the actual vendors? Is this enough remaining storage space? The flexibility, I, I'm concerned. You know, where's it going to go? You can't predict the future. You know, um, are we going to be more prepared foods where they might not eat all that? You know, how flexible is it? You know, to convert these, they're individual coolers. You can. Hey, I mean, realistically, turn the turn the the coils off and it becomes dry storage then. Mm -hmm. So in many ways, uh, you know, going to these smaller divisions <laughs> work, work for, I, I've been involved with restaurants that do that, you know, just like, so. Yeah, that's it's basically issue. an insulated wall. I mean, that's right. it doesn't matter what you do, it's just, it's yeah. just, it's just foam. It's styrofoam. It's mm -hmm. but insulated it like, styrofoam. It seems like there's a lot of storage that's bigger that's, you know, maybe the count is just slightly reduced, the actual number, but there's also a lot of small, much smaller spaces. So, well, if, if, you've, if you've been in the cages, this, this cage is which are only this deep and this wide, you know, six, 50, you know, three or 40 of them. So in many ways, I don't know how the merchants even put stuff in them that's useful to them. Right. So in many ways, we've expanded, instead of saying having three of these kind of really crazy little spaces, it might be better just to say, combine three of them into yeah. kind of in-between space. So. Yeah. And so is the upshot of that, that the effective in, uh, storage space is increased? Uh, let's put it this way. Uh, it, again, it, right now you have 11,700 square feet of total sp storage down there, right? But, but it, it's 40% vacant. So, so right now you're using 7,500 square feet. The reality is I don't think you'll ever be adding more produce people or, or more serious fresh food people that would be so demanding of, of the spaces that the market handled, you know, 40 years ago. So I think in many ways, all, all the, the refrigeration should have been, you know, should be reduced. Right. This is also way more storage than what any other market has in the country, right? right? I mean, right. <laughs> this yeah. is, I mean, th which is important, yeah, it's great, right. and it helps support West Side Market, yeah. but um, most, most markets don't have anywhere near this. Well, my sense right now is, is once, if, if we do go with the strategy of conditioning the arcade, so the produce vendors don't have to break down their space, then I'll, I'll have discussions with Tom and some of the other produce vendors to really get a better sense of if that's true, you know, how much storage space do they need that right now, they have to, again, they have to bring their whole store down every, you know, when, right. the, when the weather's bad, uh, temperatures drop or whatever. Uh, so that they may be, you know, if he's taking 500 now, I don't remember exactly, but if he's taking five, he may think 300 is perfect for him going forward. So, so and ideally, so I, if, I, when we get to the end, ideally, I th I'd like to actually have some of the refrigeration less and have more dry storage. So, and also the question, you know, it's, a, it's a fixed outer perimeter, right? So we have choices about what we put inside the box. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a question about the relative value of the shared kitchens, right? Those could be storage spaces. Our, our sense is it would really enhance the market, and we heard from the merchants that they'd like to have more production capacity you know, inside. But that, that's, that's a trade-off. I mean, you know, if, if, if you lost the... The shared commercial kitchen, you pick up, I mean, that's 3,000 I mean, square it's feet. It's 2,000. 2,000 square feet. Right. I mean, yeah. that's the difference in the math, really. So 
we think it's a great idea. We think it'll help the market meet our goals, all those good things. But it does come, you know, at, at some trade off. So do you have a finalized like cooler size and where the doors are going to be when it's done, or? You know, uh, we haven't really finalized that. I mean, right now we're saying four-foot doors is, is what we're showing in all the walk-ins. I might increase that a little bit uh, again. Part of the thing about doing this new street approach that we have is, particularly for the smaller vendors that just use a small cooler, realistically, they're not, they're not taking out a pallet jack and, and having to get inside that cooler. They're going to take their hand truck, break it down, put it into the cooler and, and that. You know, with the produce, you know, particularly, or even the meat, you know, we'll have to get into a little bit more of, you know, what is that cooler size that works. And, and maybe with this new setup and the electric charging, maybe you don't want to park your pallet in, inside the walk-ins like you do now. That's another space thing, too. Is off, often right now, vendors mm -hmm. will store their pallet jacks inside their coolers. Yeah, right. and then this has it kind of, I mean, there's at least a charging station. And there's a whole other layer of phasing, which we haven't uh, you know, approached, because we have to keep operating the entire time, right. right? So this probably has to be done in phases, which will be a challenge, and that'll drive some design issues as well, right? So, um, but I think, yeah, we just want to like show you where we're at, the basic kind of concepts, and uh, we also don't know price on this yet, and it's not going to be inexpensive, but um, with this one feedback and the uh, conversation. Well, the benefits of doing this early not just because it's needed, it's because there is vacancy now, yes. so you have to yeah. reallocate less. Yes. Yeah. That's yeah. The elevator that goes into the produce arcade, where would it come up? It would come up basically where one of the produce stands is today. Okay. So it's not in the, it's on the aisle, but it's in one of the produce stands. Okay. I think it's the one across from me, that empty one where Francisco. Okay. Uh -huh. You know which one? The corner stand? Corner stand, yeah. You know where the potatoes are? By my stand, it's the mm -hmm. one across from it. I'm not wrong. I think, I think and that's enough. And that's enough space. We'll go off from there. It's the way it works right now. Pretty much would probably take a a, a, stall, a bay and a half, okay. because I have to get the elevator. I have to get a staircase in because some people don't want to wait for the elevator. They just run down the stairs, and I need some distance for the pallets to get in between the stairs. So. Okay. Keep going. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's, let's, let's now go up two stories, <laughs> talk about the mezzanine. Okay. Great space. <laughs> what should we do with it? <laughs> so one of the things we're talking about is, you know, right. right now you have this uh, vacant space that the city's cl uh, cleaned out. Uh, you have the old locker rooms right now upstairs. Our, our feeling is just it's a higher, better use to get rid of the locker rooms and, and, and do something different. And so one of the things we're, we're proposing is this would be, uh, would, would be flipped over to an event space. And not, not only do you have a great view of, of the city of Cleveland um, in one direction, but you also can overlook the market. So it's going to be a great space. Uh, and the, the, the present locker room space, we're, that's where we're talking about having a teaching kitchen. So. This is the existing plan right now is, is you have a couple you know, sm small offices here. You have the association conference room up in the upper left-hand corner. Um, this is partially uh, floored over, but right now it's just a little bit of dry storage for the existing seafood merchant, uh, Kate, Kate's. Uh, and this kind of shows you the existing bathroom array and, and locker rooms on, on this side of the, and, and really I, I, it's not really used, so. And bathroom is only acceptable for the diner. Yes, you have to. Well, no, they, you can do it this way too. So this is a, again a, a kitchen that we did in uh, the downtown market in Grand Rapids. It's a, it's a teaching kitchen. Basically, there were six stations uh, and a station for the instructor as well. Um, we actually put hoods in there so the, with with gas cooking devices. Uh, on this one, we probably won't go that way. Um, and, and these counters actually are designed to go up and down because we, we do it for, for children's summer school. They'll have like a cooking class. And so the stuff can move up and down. You know, we have TV screens so you can actually see what the chef is doing sometimes. It's better when he's preparing stuff to see it on a screen above. Um, so, and this is where it's activated. So again, basically what we're trying to do is, is add a new elevator uh, in the west end for the office space, which is one, one down to the restrooms. We're also talking about adding a, a new elevator in the east end as well, which would basically help uh, get people up to this kitchen as well as to the event space. Because again, for events, it has to be compliant. So, 
and this is the layout basically, uh, starting with this upper, uh, starting with this lower uh, left hand corner, uh, would be just the existing office space reconfigured to be a little bit more efficient and so forth. Have created a little bit of a conference room. Right now we're kind of calling that the marketing space. And then the space right now where the association room is and the other leftover office, again, that would be split up into a much more efficient uh, group of offices for, for management. At this end here, we're suggesting filling in the, the, the remaining part of the floor that's open right now, creating a grand staircase that would go downstairs to where the, where the old seafood area was, um, add a new elevator that would service this entire level. So basically, you would come up these stairs uh, and then enter the event space, or come up this, this elevator and enter the event space, or if you're uh, handicapped, you come up and hit this level and kind of go through these small doors. We're trying to keep people, the public, out of these two main service uh, staircases because they're very narrow, they're, and plus you have work, uh, employees going up and down all the time. Uh, so in many ways, you have kind of like this grand staircase, elevator, a lobby space, a room that, for, you know, that someone could prepare for the event speaker, we call it, call it speaker room. Ted calls it a bride room, a green room, bride a, room. Green room bride <laughs> a couple of restrooms up here so that if you are uh, using the event space, you don't have to go downstairs at all. And then this side over here is where we're creating the teacher's kitchen. Okay, so the event space can handle about 50 people, maybe standing, you know, 75 to 80 people, but for a seated dinner, we can probably fit 50 people in there, which is a nice size. And a little bar. And a little bar. So this uh, shows you the teaching kitchen. Uh, basically, it's a series of, of mobile six foot tables with hot plates. And so basically, it can be configured all different ways depending on what the instructor is trying to teach at that time. An another sta uh, a station for the instructor. And then we have a, a real kitchen with a hood and a demonstration thing. So, in many ways, um, the instructor could be here preparing something. The, the the people could be you know wrapped around this major thing, and then go back to their own stations. We have a series of sinks here. So again, like for children, you learn how to how to cut carrots and so forth before they put it into their salad or their stews or whatever. Uh, just has a lot of flexibility. Uh, we have a, a individual toilet for this way. That way, in case it is students or or young people or, or it could be anybody, they don't have to leave this uh, teaching kitchen facility uh, after hours. Uh, we have a hidden cleanup room, storage, walk-in cooler upstairs. So it's a very nice functioning, you know, teaching kitchen. Yeah, so. Also the catering kitchen. And catering. With well, the idea, too, that this is an event going on in the evening, this would be the catering kitchen, the backup kitchen that would serve the food. And that's the, that's the other reason we went with a hood here. You know, some catering steps, you know, bring their own food, but others do like to prepare. So it gives you full versatility for this event space, which is great. Are, are the uh, uh, kind of the student areas that you're saying there, are those flexible so that they could be removed? Like if that were to turn into like a demonstration kitchen for? Yeah, everything's on wheels, everything is, you know, again, electrical. Uh, so we, we talked today about maybe having the power come above, right? so you can plug anything in or put it away and it all retracts, you can move them, put chairs there. There's, there's lots of flexibility. We're not you're totally sure. I mean, we, there's so many different audiences yeah. for this kitchen. We like, it, we like it to be able to handle you know, whomever and, and it'll evolve. Uh, so we, we, got, we, we had the guest grad meetings this afternoon with the uh, uh, nutrition education folks from the Cleveland Clinic. And um, you know, we got drilled down to all the you know, different uses for it. And uh, we want it to be flexible at this point because there, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of possibilities. So I think there was again a real good endorsement we got this afternoon for this approach. Um, so it, it is more flexible than the, um, the, the Grand Rapids one where things are, are fixed. But what you talked about, the, I mean, he, he puts these, the, the kitchen's on hydraulic lift. You push a button and it goes from 36 inches, like normal kitchen counter height, down to 30 inches. So kids can stand there and cook. And it was a pretty simple mechanism. First one, but it was a great innovation. And, and, it, and it, they, they, had, they had cooking camps for kids and all sorts of stuff. I know we've talked about you know, having school kids be able to come to the market and getting them excited about food and cooking is important. And so when they can stand there and cook and you know, do their own thing, uh, it's, I think that's the best way of, of getting them excited about food and, and, uh, and the market. So this could be a pretty cool program. You know, and, 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 and you mentioned the demonstration kitchen. And, and a lot of marks we do, you know, we'll have a demonstration kitchen like that with a bunch of, uh, the ability to put a bunch of seats here for, for something. We've had a lot of butchers do like how to make sausages and different, how to slice different kinds of meats. And so, so it's not only just your traditional like, you know, I'll teach you how to make a, you know, a flan or something like that. It's, it's really hands-on uh, products, you know, from 
some of the great people you have in your market, you know, whether it be butchers or produce and so forth, and especially from an educational point of view as well. So, And for them to collaborate together too, where mm -hmm. you can have vendors with different products doing things together, not yeah. just one thing. And, and here, to get to this space, I think just one of the challenges you have to recognize is that right. there's no elevator to the teaching kitchen side. Yeah, the, the biggest flaw with this plan is, is it, for the teaching kitchen, you, you still could have people come up to the restaurant, but the restaurant has different hours and so forth, so that's a little bit tricky. You could say if there was no event, they would come up the grand staircase or the elevator, simply walk across this room to get to the teaching kitchen. Um, so, and, and we have to have a, a little a handicap lift here because you're basically going from this level up to this level and then down to this level again. So, so that's that's one of the limitations. Now, the city architects. Um, do you have that, yeah, Jordan? In one of their uh, studies of of this event space, they had suggested putting a bridge across here. You know, and initially, you know, before we really got deep into it, it's like that, that seems like a lot of money. But it, it really does make the, the operational aspect of the, the, the teaching kitchen and the event space, they, they, both can be work, they both can be active at the same time, which is great. So that's one advantage. And it does give you just a little bit more. You know, right now, the only great way to look, overlook the market is, is the little balcony at, the, at, the, at that one end. And so this would be a little bit more of a generous approach to that where you could have more people, you know, overlooking the market hall and experience it rather than just on that one little thing. Uh, to me, it's a little bit like the, it's the cherry on the sundae. If, if it's possible, it would really just make the whole flow work better, uh, but we'll just have to look at it, you know. But it might be a million dollars for something to do that. Yeah. How much does it increase the event capacity? It really doesn't because the, if you're doing a sit down dinner or event, then you really are always limited to this one big space. Now, if it's more like a, a kind of a free-flowing, you know, wine, stand-up table cocktail, then it, it definitely increases it. And it also plays up the whole experience of, of overlooking the market hall. You see in the picture on the top right, there's stairs that you go down right. to that balcony. Right. So they're not the same level. Because that level is at this level and this level and this thing's up. But right now, that doesn't open. That would right. have to be. Right. Yeah. And how much do we know about the market demand for events of a size that would fit into the proposed space? I mean, is there actual demand? It's not that big. Yeah, I, I've talked, I've mostly just talked to people who do events to ask around to kind of get a better understanding. Um, and it seems like, depending on how it was priced, it could be really appealing, especially as a a lot of so trust across the street is that new um, event space with an intro. When I took them up there, they were like, "This is perfect because we don't have a place to do like a wedding ceremony. Like we need more ceremony space, so then people could go across the street for a big party." Um, or same with, wedding activities, like a shower yeah, like a shower or, or so. So I don't think that you would do. I mean, obviously you can have like a big wedding, but I mean, I, mean, I will say it's the project, the Grand Rapids Downtown Market. We have a greenhouse on the roof and we have an event room. They do three weddings a day. It's the number one wedding venue in the city since it opened. People love to have their, venue, their, their, their uh, weddings at the market. And so while this space is a little different and doesn't have all the amenities that that has, uh, it's an, this space is incredible in terms of the views and, and people love the market. So you get those two things together. I think that there is huge demand uh, and you know, if it's done right, uh, and, and you know, uh, again, we, we started the economic modeling, but uh, you know, we will estimate the income from the event side, and and uh, the alcohol sales you know, can be a significant part of that too. So, you know, having more space is good. I mean, that's, again, it's, as, as you mentioned, it's, it's a question. You know, do, do we have the capital to, to uh, pay for it? So, uh, I'll, I'll say even anecdotally, like we like when Amanda was here, we used to get like phone calls all the time from people like asking us like where can I have my various events in this neighborhood? And there were like no event places at all to recommend. Um, to the, I think intro is like booked a year out for the wedding. That's a much larger venue, but I mean, I could see this as corporate. I mean, there are so many different yeah. uses for a space like this. I think that- Dan, I can speak to that. Oh yeah. Um, the, the, the demand for events is enormous. Um, and th this seating count, just this general count of people that you're suggesting here is kind of a, a perfect, like, there's like a no man's land right now that this, this num guest count is not really served. And I think 
as Tom was just mentioning, you know, our, our space across the street, our typical wedding size and event size is 175 and up, right? It's a big space. So the, there are numerous, and not just weddings, like, you know, business events and breakfasts and luncheons and all these kind of things for, you know, with the groups of the size 60 to 110, 120 that don't make sense to have in our space. And they have really nowhere else that's set up for their needs to, to go. And I think, um, the views, the just the nostalgia, the history, everything kind of coalescing here is, is this is a perfect use of the space. And actually, this I was going to ask before you got to these slides if if an option to kind of blow out the glass wall that looks into the market was an option, but it looks like this sort of suggests that already. So um, it's a great use of space. It also lets those sorts of events um, sort of flow outward and provide just extra energy and attention on that market hall, which is where everybody wants to be anyway. Yep. Um, so just, you know, my two cents is that this, this plan, at least at, at this stage in the game, is, is the right direction. I would agree, actually. I, I've used the Skylight Financial space mm -hmm. a number of times, both personal and business. And I'm guessing that's pretty similar yeah. sized. Mm -hmm. I think it, it's got to be close. Yeah. And it's perfect for either, like you said, 75 people wandering, having a hors d'oeuvre cocktail thing, or, you know, a certain sit down meal for a little bit less than that. And it's, it's really popular, we could use it. The, the other thing too is, is, you know, we have heard comments from a lot, a lot of the public saying they need areas to, to sit. The, the one thing you never want to try to do with the market is, is take out stalls for seating. You know, really just kind of, so it, actually all, all the new markets I design, I've been designing a lot of them over the years, I always put my seating areas up on the mezzanine overlooking the market hall. And so I try to keep the maximum of, of, of leasable fresh food downstairs. And, and, I, and honestly, if we put a, like a, 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 a counter with stools here, you would not have a stool open there ever. I mean, they're just the most popular places in my markets to be. And, and you, you know, you get a lot of young people who grab lunch downstairs or bake good and sit there with their computers and do their thing all day. So Would the whole space be open? <clears throat> like, if it wasn't rented out to the public, like on a Saturday and stuff like that? That's, That's the thinking right now. Uh, mm -hmm. It's also a great space to have, like, for um, a starting point for tours and stuff like that with, like, I mean, think about how much they always gum up the aisles and things mm -hmm. like that and the ability to have a starting point to bring groups of kids up, educational uses, like, you, this could be super multi. -tour. And, and here, the, the circulation idea is that this has its own entrance, and hence it can be open after hours and not have any access to the floor. Isn't that the, the <coughs> is that possible? Or Did you put the ground floor in? No, I didn't. Okay. Basically, the way the ground floor works is <clears throat> you have the elevator and the grand stair. This is the old plan. Okay, here's the new one. So you basically have the elevator and the, and the, the, the grand staircase goes down to the old seafood space. And, and you have the door right here, which basically would be the after hours entrance into the event space. So basically, you would come into the market hall, and we do this all the time. We're basically between this corner stall, this stall, and the two here. You simply block off these two aisles. And so what's really cool about that in many ways is, is you're coming to an event, you at least get to see, imagine the grand space all lit up and so forth, and then you come up the stairs and the elevator to the event space, and then again, you're looking at the great space. So it's a, it, there's a real magic to how the circulation works. So. Any questions? I think that it is imperative to do some version of this plan with the bridge connecting the two sides and creating that uh, additional space and the overlook for people during the market days. And I just, I just think it's so much uh, an improvement. Okay. Yeah, no, Even though it'll be more expensive, I think it's, mm -hmm. I actually think this would probably be the easiest thing to raise money for. <laughs> <laughs> we raise money for this and pay for the, uh, the basement? Yeah, it's like fire. <laughs> 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 I only know when I have a memorial <laughs> <laughs> on <a> refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a space for uh, vendors for a break room? I mean, I saw maintenance and security, but for those of us who stand for 12 hours a day, we have or nowhere to sit, we have nowhere to eat. What's the one in the right. basement? 
the the base would be great uh, break room and next to lockers down there. Okay. So, I'm not sure market employee for everybody or for just for market employees, Marie said. Right, but right. like you just yeah. asking about uh, the, you're, you're talking about uh, uh, vendors. Yeah, well, room. say, you yeah. know, it, we, we either have to take a customer space or we have to eat in our stand mm -hmm. or if or we have to go sit in the disgusting right. locker room and so we can right. sit down because you can't you can't sit anywhere. There's mm -hmm. nowhere to sit. Well, hopefully you can sit up here. Well, yeah. <laughs> if I want to be seen. <laughs> but if I don't, because I talk to 300 and some people a day, you know, sometimes you just, because you, I also, you know, other, we also have to handle other business too. So I've got a bakery going on, I've got people calling me, I've got wholesalers i got to deal with, i got other stuff, just like all these other people that have their, their you know, their business within their business because of their business, you know, I'm yeah. not asking for office space. Mm -hmm. Trust me, I, I'm not asking about that, but I'm, I'm just saying there's some place that employees need to go to be separate from customers, because usually we're all wearing something with our name mm -hmm. on it, and um, you know, or we're in our aprons or whatever, and you just, you just wanna, you can't leave. Yeah, right. But you wanna get away, <laughs> well, I'm saying. Yeah, and I guess you know, we could enlarge or we could separate. And I don't want that to break always break. be in a bathroom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know no, what I'm you. You're freezing yeah. and you're standing by the radio and you're like, oh God, please don't let no, somebody come in. I'm just, I just need to get warm. No, I think, yeah, I mean, we, we could really add more of that in the basement. It's a trade off. Again, you know, we have anything else uh, in, in the fixed space, but uh, that could certainly be added. If, if folks felt that's important. Yeah, he was asking you today, like if the employee locker room, like if people use the lockers. I said, I know people use it to like eat lunch, take a phone call, but I haven't seen the lockers oh, used. that place has not been clean. Yeah. Ever. <laughs> <laughs> Ever. <laughs> so uh, I'm gonna say no, unless it's just to hide whatever oh, yeah. things that should not be happening, sure. happening. Mm -hmm. um, but for us normal people, they just want to go sit down, have a bite, handle a phone call, send some emails, take a break from our, you know, okay, I got the stand covered, can I have 15 minutes? Mm -hmm. You know, and that's all I'm saying is like the people that basically are the heart of the market, which is all the vendors and their employees, they're going to need a minute because there's a lot going on there and you're, you know, sometimes you can't leave or walk away for quite a while. And sometimes you're the only one there and you have to go and you don't have the, you know, okay, I'll be right back. But if, if you could get away from everything going on, it would be nice if, you know, you, it's also because we don't see each other. You see each other, but you really don't. There is no community outside that. You have to go into somebody's stand or go buy something from them. And, and that's how your communication is. And so, you know, after that is over, you're, there is no gathering place for us to be in touch. There really isn't. So I'm not saying that we, we need a giant space. I'm just saying that if, you know, we, we rotate out, everybody rotates out. Okay, so this person goes, that person goes, or whatever. But I think you would see each other more and be connected a little more and also have some time away from the market itself to actually have a friendship or a relationship that doesn't involve purchasing, you know, but just to be, as opposed to coming in and out of the bathroom, and that's pretty much because there's no, there is no space for that, and our and our stands are not big enough for us to have a seat, right, right, at all, <laughs> and I wouldn't I wouldn't need a space downstairs, at all, if my stand was if I could use my wall space in my stand, mm -hmm. but I can't because of the way it's constructed. Right. So, but um, that's it. Great. I would like to have a snack in peace and yeah. <laughs> talk to my neighbors, you yeah. know, about other things other than what's right in front of us. Right. Gotcha. Okay, great. Well, I hope this was useful. Uh, we're making progress. Um, so yeah, we, we did the basement, we did the, we did the, uh, the mezzanine. We're gonna come back. Uh, with the, the, the ground floor, um, you know, we talk about the next round of strategy and merchandise. It's more complicated because there are bigger strategies issues to address, but also the design issues. So we want to start with these two that felt a little more straightforward. Um, and then in, in the coming weeks and months, we'll, we'll have more on the, uh, the, uh, the main floor. And have you, have you looked at all at the 
Tenants Association space. Uh, next to the the conference room. Yeah, that's going to be office space. Right, office space. Yeah. And I, I foresee tenant association meetings happening in the like conference room, yeah. like the staff conference yeah. room. Yeah. Or just to know if that, I mean, that's it's like all, an interestingly configured space that might allow right, to do something some of what you're talking about. Yeah. Oh, okay. I mean, I think, um, I think the basic concept is that the market management, you know, we're going to have more staff members than they do now. So uh, Hugh was designed to have kind of the marketing department perhaps on one side and the operations, you know, on, and, and the director on, on, the, on the other side. So, and then one elevator again that can serve the ADA uh, compliance for the whole, the whole area. Well, I know this is draft, but like I would argue, are those uses better in a adjacent building on West 25th that can be like back office? Because I, I don't want to belabor the point, but it's a really good point of having a space for the vendors. And like that's how you foster community. Mm -hmm. If I always have to go talk to them at a stand, I'm not likely to do that. But mm -hmm. if we're eating lunch together, I'm going to say, like, hey, how are your kids? Well, like, you know, and yeah. start having those conversations that yeah. pays dividends down the floor. Well, I, 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 well two, two, two thoughts. One is that the management is also a critical part of the community, and, and they, and not have, uh, <laughs> good management is a good one. So we want them to be very engaged and part of the market life and, and there to do it. Secondly, you know, the, the Tenant Association does have this conference room, but it's not convenient. It's not, you know, it's, it's not a great, it, people don't convene there, even though it, it has been historically the place where the merchants have had their, so I don't think this is a good place for it. I think place where, it's like finding the right place that is close enough to the activity, but also a little bit off. And so I, I think this is, this is up in a corner and, and would not be, even if we said, this is the merchant space, it's like it's, it's a party that no one goes to because it's not, it's not where the uh, uh, action is. And I do think it, if you move management off, off site, the, they're not as responsive. Yeah. It's just like it's raining out. Do I really have to go over and listen to her, you know, or whatever, you know, it's just like it's, it's much easier that you can go up the stairs, scream at somebody. Excuse me? Cincinnati. And, and, and I, went, I, went, I met with them uh, a couple months ago, and, and that's all they complained about, was they felt yeah, so the disconnected. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we had them all right. like yeah. block. Right, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 But we also well, like, want the management to be using the bathrooms, so they're like, yeah, right. you know, they're, they're paying attention to all, all the important stuff. Yeah. <laughs> all right, one last thing on our agenda tonight, uh, which is um, the parking lots. Um, so as part of our work, um, we we're, were tasked with uh, doing a kind of a high level analysis of the potential to utilize uh, a section of the parking lot for a private development. Um, uh, and so we, we kind of started to think about that. Now, simultaneously, the city uh, has been thinking about uh, you know, looking at development options for these sites. So I don't know how much, you know, yeah, talk. Is, okay. So, um, so I, I just wanted to kind of outline some of the things that were there to be development uh, on these uh, sites, some of the things that I think are, are important for them to enhance the market. And I think the way I look at it is not to take away from the market. How do you have these be developed and enhance the market? So what, 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 what can we do to make sure it, it continues to serve the needs it does today, but be more than just parking lots? So the, 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 what, what I have been thinking about is that first of all, we need to make sure we have enough short-term customer parking. As I think we very clearly demonstrated in the phase one study, people are coming from all over the place and they're driving and they're spending the most money. So we, we have to continue. While we'd like to have people use public transportation, it certainly would help if the red line actually ran. I've tried to use it when I've been here in the past and it wasn't working. So we're gonna to continue to need to rely on cars uh, even if we build up the local trade. Um, it's, it's, it's not, that's not gonna go away. So we need to keep the customer, maintain the customer parking quantities. Um, for those merchants who use monthly parking, although I guess it's not very money because the most merchant parking is on a different lot is my understanding, right? So, so maybe some monthly parking uh, to accommodate uh, uh, merchants. You know, if there are buildings here, I, I would want there to be continuous ground floor retail that has uh, uses supportive of a market district. So more food and food related local businesses. So people coming to here, coming to Westside Market, uh, any, if there's any buildings on these lots that they have retail that enhances. And so you get like the other great market districts in the country. I mean, I think how a city is like that on, on, you know, on the adjacent streets, this would kind of further enhance uh, the customer experience. Um, and perhaps some larger spaces or additional spaces for merchants who can't get in the market and have related product or are growing and want to be across the street uh, uh, as well. If any design, I would say you'd want to have it stepped back. If there's been any, any towers here, it's got to be moved away from the historic building. So uh, the further away from the, the market, that'd be an important design consideration. And then I think we certainly would want to look at how do we 
um, address some operational things like uh, waste management potentially being inside uh, the, the development. So it's um, particularly where the, uh, some of the waste management is happening on the, um, the West Side Market lot that uh, any developer would require to, to kind of utilize some of that space uh, for waste management as well, since that's an ongoing bottleneck here. So those are some of the thoughts about how do we make sure whatever happens here is uh, supportive of the market. I think certainly having people living here, you know, adds more customers. So that's a good thing, as long as we don't lose the parking. And again, free, convenient, how do we make it even better parking? It's, like, it's not just parking, it's good customer parking, uh, well signed, you know, well signed, all, all those things. Well lit. Well, I think also as we're talking about this, you know, obviously I, I think it's a good idea, but the important part is the financial model supports the West Side markets yeah. in long-term sustainability and all the improvements that you've seen is going to cost a lot of money. The only thing I would caution is most people who don't live in urban areas do not like parking garages. So if we get rid of surface parking, it may deter a lot of people from coming. So I'd, I know it's a delicate dance, yeah. right? But if it was all structured parking, I think we'd lose customers who would just choose not to come because mm -hmm. they don't like parking garages. I just agree with both points Jason made, especially the potential revenue stream for the market is critical. And so many other markets have that revenue stream from parking and rely on it, so. It's where we started 12 plus years ago, right? Like we were kind of hired to bring in consultants and look at a whole plan for these lots. And uh, we basically, the output of that was you could take this, you could segment it off, you could have some service parking, you could land lease the rest of this land and completely eliminate the amount that the market is in the red every year. And that turned into a $3.3 .3 million service parking lot. <laughs> With no revenue. With no revenue, <laughs> which is a different conversation. <laughs> All right, I think that's, oh, um, yeah, this, this is, you've seen this before. We're still tracking pretty good. Um, again, we're, we're very close to, um, you know, on the transition process, uh, you know, the bylaws, the, I mean, the articles of incorporation are written. They're just about ready to submit. Again, the board, you know, after uh, tonight's vote, is ready to be announced. Um, the boards, so we're, we're the fifth line of board selection and trading. So we're about, to, we've done the selection process. Um, you know, we'll, we'll start thinking about, you know, some people obviously have been part of this process and are very knowledgeable. Others are new to the process. So we want to, you know, make sure we're educating everyone. And I think the speaker series and some other things um, will be important. Um, you know, at, once we have the board and we have the adcom, we got to figure out <laughs> who does what as we move forward. So we're not wasting anyone's time and, and not asking people to commit too much time. So that's still, we need to put our heads around that a little bit to make sure that that, that still makes sense for everyone. But I think we're making progress on every other piece. Um, the operating agreement, you know, we started to think about that and we have examples from other communities of, of their management agreements. So uh, Jessica and I will be working on a draft uh, to share with this group about, you know, uh, structuring this management agreement. Um, that obviously can be a very important piece uh, uh, going forward. Um, but we're, we're still tracking pretty well. That's my last slide. Any parting comments or thoughts? Progress. Yeah. It's really a nice piece of work. Thank you very much. Sure. It really is. Great project to work on. Great project to work on. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.